Many of us have only dreamed of going to space, but only a few of the best and brightest have actually had the opportunity. But an even smaller amount have spent long periods of time there. The experiments and data collected from these pioneers is helping scientists and future astronauts learn more about the effects of long-duration missions on the human body. One of these pioneers that has spent significant time in space helping lead the way is astronaut Michael Fohl. A veteran of six space flights, Fohl is credited with four spacewalks totaling almost 23 hours. He's also spent time on both the Russian space station Mir and was the commander of Expedition 8 aboard the International Space Station. He currently holds the U.S. record for time spent in space at 374 days, 11 hours, and 19 minutes. So who better to help us understand what it's like to actually live and eat in space? Johnny Alonzo spoke with Dr. Fole to find out how it works. The International Space Station is without doubt one of the most amazing structures ever built. Orbiting Earth some 242 miles above us, its stated goal is to teach us how to live in space for long periods of time. Although there are many areas of scientific study being researched, one of the most important is food technology. Understanding how the human body interacts with food and microgravity will be one of several key questions that need to be answered when we travel outside of Earth's orbit for long periods of time. Who better to ask about food in space than an astronaut who spent over a year on both the ISS and the Mir eating a variety of different foods? Astronaut Mike Fole will give us a skinny on what it's like to live in space and to find out how it works. Eating in space is a, a treat. Um, basically, you get hungry, you get thirsty, just like we do on Earth. I think after the first day in space, when you get launched into space, your stomach lifts up into your a little, lifts up a little bit as you float. And so, for the very first hours after arrival in space, there isn't a desire to eat. And that is because you're finding some vestibular issues, some nausea. But those pass, and they pass pretty quickly. In my case, two or three hours. After about two orbits, an orbit is one and a half hours, okay. 90 minutes. After about two or three orbits, you're starting to get ready to take off your spacesuit that you used to launch into space. In, this, in my last flight, it was on a Soyuz rocket. You get out of this cramped space, stretch out, you change clothes into something soft, not this bulky, awkward spacesuit. And then you think about eating. There are many different types of fare, food fare, I mean, uh, in space. On the Soyuz rocket, which is probably the most meager food cuisine I've come across in my uh, career, okay. the Soyuz simply has uh, dried foods and juices. This food is really not made for a real meal. Uh, however, it's enough to get us by for the two days it takes to get to the International Space Station. I have a turkey with uh, crab apple and cranberry sauce. We get to Space Station after two days, and oh, it's a wonderful, wonderful sight. Because you know, not only there are friends there, there's more places to stretch out and move about, big windows, yeah. but there's also food, real food. Real food <laughs> and they're talking to you about it. You know, they're saying, hey, what should we put on for you? And uh, the first thing that came to my mind was I remembered my experience of the Russian foods and American foods that we shared, 50-50. Yeah. Where we keep our food. The red boxes are Russian food. The blue boxes are American food. Why do we have so few American boxes? That's a good question. I'm not sure what I'm going to have tonight, but I think it's going to be American. Ah, got chocolate pudding cake. Not sure I want that just yet. Uh, I don't know. Let's try something else. One of the worst things to eat in space, but they still keep sending it, both Americans and Russians, they send crackers. And you eat crackers and they go, <laughs> and you have all these crumbs flying out. And yeah. the whole issue is to somehow put the cracker into your mouth and then sort of seal your, your, your lips around it. And then crunch on it so the crackers, the uh, crumbs don't explode out of your mouth. Tell me, does food in space taste differently than it does here on Earth? The whole issue of taste in space uh, is one of, I think, research. In my personal experience, I don't believe my tastes, my sens sens sensation of taste really changes in space. I did notice on my first long duration flight on the space station here, over time I started to want or crave salty foods more. So Mike, uh, when it's time to eat, do you guys, you know, all get together at the table, or do you sit by yourself? Yeah. What's the procedure? 
Well, the most important thing I think anybody does in a day is eat. And what do we do? We're social creatures, human beings, and we like to eat together. And that's where social events normally occur, is around food or drink. Same is true in space. And uh, as the commander of the International Space Station, I understood very, very clearly that I was not going to let us, just two of us for most of the time, Sasha, Kaleri, and myself, eat at different times. Because then we would start to come apart, we wouldn't understand it, there wouldn't be the exchange, it would just be very, very poor. It's hard enough living for six and a half months in a small space with only one other person sure. far away from everybody else. Yeah. So I said, Sash, we're going to have breakfast, we're going to have maybe you know, a coffee break about 11, and we're going to go to lunch, sure. and we're going to have fixed lunch, and we're not going to let the ground bother us, and we're going to make it clear to the ground we don't want to be bothered. Good. Then we're going to go to tea at about you know, like four, yeah. and then we go to evening meal at about seven. And sure enough, we then got this routine going. This is a good example of a space shuttle tray, not often used, simply because the tray really is designed to hold your food. Now here, in front of you, it's very convenient for me to just hold the implements that I would use to talk about eating. But actually, on the International Space Station, or indeed on the Space Shuttle, there's so much Velcro patches around that you can always use the same food implements sure. yeah. or items to simply stick your food to whatever Velcro is near you. And it'll, uh -huh. any wall, any surface generally has some Velcro nearby. And it attaches just with a little Velcro uh, circle. They always make a point on this Space Station or on the Space Shuttle to have hook Velcro on the items that you would attach and they always have pile Velcro on the walls. Okay. Pile is softer, it doesn't scratch your skin for yes. one thing, so it's just more comfortable to be around everywhere. And then you make hook Velcro, the stuff that's just kind of small and specific. And so uh, I'm holding right here um, minestrone soup. I notice there's a barcode. Uh -huh. and there's also soup minestrone, which yeah. is in Russian, yeah. and I read that for you. Um, the barcode is used uh, in the case that we have to do any food logging experiments. They know exactly how many calories, what the food value is of this packet. And we have food specialists who know exactly what's in this. All the vitamins, all the calories, fats, etc., and cholesterols. If we're going to drink water, for example, sure. we would still log it. Even though there's no calories in it, we would scan the, scan the packet right. and we'd fill it with the right amount of water. So we've been talking about all this food. I mean, how do you control your weight in orbit? Obviously, you eat more or you eat less and, and your weight will change. Sure. Uh, in space, the initial reaction, the first two days, is for you to go to the toilet a lot, and you lose a lot of fluids. Um, you probably lose five to 10 pounds just in the first two days, just through fluid loss. And a lot of the fluid is coming from your legs, and it's also shifting up into your upper body. And that's why when you see people in, uh, on television from space, they kind of have slightly puffed up cheeks. I do believe we actually lose that fluid shift somewhat in our faces because we've basically just lost fluid. So that's a change in the body, and so you have lost weight at that point. And we measure our mass every two weeks. And the first month of my flight, we talk to our flight surgeons, our doctors, every week about how things are going, and generally it's always a, how you doing, you know, nothing's wrong, etc. They want us to eat enough so that our mass, our weight on Earth, stays the same. And it's, they know that when you come back to Earth, those astronauts, and we've, we've had many different types of flight, many different cases, those astronauts that have not kept their weight on orbit, but have lost weight, do very poorly recovering on Earth. Um, they don't get the fluids back into their body quick enough, they aren't strong enough to move around easily. So I was being told by my flight surgeon, Mike, eat. And I went, yes, I will. <laughs> so it was simply a license to eat. So that's how it works. So if you're into really expensive takeout, I got the stuff for you. Mmm, minestrone. That's all for this edition of NASA's Destination Tomorrow. I'm Kara O'Brien. For all of us here at NASA, we'll see you next time.